Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning, dear friends, and welcome to this module. In the previous modules, we have seen how intersectionality is an important critical intervention as we move towards our contemporary understanding of gender. We find that intersectionality was the critical tool which, for the first time, alerted us to the possibility that exploitations are multifaceted and the categorization of people into uniform ones perhaps is not justifiable. Continuing our argument, today we would look at the work and contribution of Audre Lorde. Audre Lorde is a famous American poet. She is also a novelist as well as an essayist. She was also designated as Poet Laureate of New York in 1991. Unfortunately, her life ended in 1992 owing to her long ailments. Her first volume of poems, The First Cities, was published in 1968. She had lived through various roles. She was a black woman, a mother, a daughter, a feminist. By her sexual choices and preferences, she was a lesbian. She was also a visionary. And as Adrian Rich has commented, her poems have an elemental wideness as well as the capability to heal. They include the nightmare as well as lucidity simultaneously. Lorde had adopted what has been come to be known as theory of difference. The idea is that the binary opposition between conventional genders of men and women is oversimplistic. As Lester Olson has commented in his article that though feminists have found it necessary to present the illusion of a solid unified whole in the context of these two categories, the category of women and by extension the category of men is also full of subdivisions and Lord sensitizes us to this fact. Lorde has reviewed the contemporary feminist tendencies of categorizing people together, grouping them under the pretense that perhaps there is a homogeneity of experience. It overlooks the fact that the individuals who are being categorized in a single manner in fact belong to diverse backgrounds. They belong to diverse communities with different types of racial histories, for example. So, if we put them together, this becomes an unjustifiable pretense. And she tries to continue this argument by looking at these categories of being a woman or the tendency to merge women into this concept of sisterhood. She says that the diverse communities have inseparable operations which are different in their own ways and to group them together would be a misleading attempt. She also suggests that the artificial distinctions such as racism, sexism or homophobia should not be ignored and she suggests that a tendency towards ignoring and misnaming of these differences impacts people. And she explains it further, difference according to her translates into devaluation and distancing. It justifies the exclusion of certain categories of people from the mainstream and results into a lack of communication and therefore it renders the suppressed sections of the society and transfers them into silent and almost invisible entities. Difference also results into hierarchical dynamics in the context of political power, institutional powers, moral judgment translating into different types of social privileges. It ultimately provides irrationalization for assigning responsibility 
for working across the differences to members of the less powerful group, a practice which often results into a form of blaming the victims of oppression and therefore categorizing people into inseparable segments and overlooking the inherent differences is a wrong tendency which was being adopted by major contemporary feminist dialogue. In the works of Laude, we find that she has been able to identify different issues. She has looked at the issues of race, class, age and ageism, sex and sexuality and later in life she has also looked at the issues of chronic illness as well as disability. Her illness and disability concepts became more prominent in her later years as she was grappling with cancer. She also says that all these factors are fundamental to her experience and essence of being a woman and no single aspect or no single perspective can be given more preference in comparison to others. She also says that although it is true that in feminist concerns, it is this aspect of gender, the differences in conventional genders that have received all the focus, but still it is necessary for us to recognize other differences also and address to them. Although she is primarily known as a poet, she has also written in various genres. I would particularly refer to her novel Zami, a new spelling of my name, which is noted for its explicit and evocative imagery and its treatment of mother-daughter relationship. Her other prose volumes include Sister Outsider, Essays and Speeches and A Burst of Light, which won a National Book Award. Her last volume of poetry was published posthumously in 1993 under the title of The Marvelous Arithmetics of Distance. Lord has also been an activist. Along with some friends and writer Barbara Smith, she had founded an active feminist press, Kitchen Table Women of Color Press. The name refers to the kitchen as heart of every home as well as a space which is traditionally assigned to women. It was not only a press, but so long Lord was alive, it was also a resource network for women of color. Lord published various titles under this press, including her own collection of poetry, I Am Your Sister. Lord has produced several poetry collections as well as several other books. Today I have taken up those poetry collections and other aspects of her writing which are more important for us to understand in the context of intersectionality. In this context, I would first of all take up The Black Unicorn, her poetry collection which had come out in 1978. Black Unicorn has explored Lord's relationship with womanhood as she has provided insight into the interwoven nature of different types of operations sexism, she has talked about African culture, the sexual and spiritual awakening as well as the issues of race, affirming that feminism necessitates focusing on each of these elements. I would refer to Adrian Rich again, who had suggested that it is a collection of poems by a woman who is known for the complexity of her vision, for her moral courage and the catalyst passion of her language. Lord had utilized intersectionality as the feminist aesthetics in this particular book, establishing agency and empowerment of women through a retrieval of spirituality, autonomy, sexuality as well as racial pride. When we look at the concept of intersectionality in the context of Lord's poem, we find that she has woven a tapestry of spirituality wovenhood and racial operations very lucidly. Spiritual empowerment and its combination with womanhood is a recurring theme in Lord. It is also exhibited in this poetry collection, The Black Unicorn. It also unveils the operation of African culture and the belief systems associated with it. European domination had eradicated the African belief systems as 
it had contrasted with the European Christianity, the dominant religion of the slavers. Lord's spirituality honors the ancient strength and grace of African culture. She celebrates the priestess, the solstice, full moons as well as pagan worship. Her invocation of the African goddess illustrates a time when women were worshipped for their natural life cycles as well as sexuality. Image of the moon in several poems in this collection including the black unicorn, a woman speaks and meet symbolize sanctity of womanhood as the moon's common association with women has derived from the ancient beliefs that a woman's menstrual cycles as well as her pregnancy mirror the natural rhythms. Imagery of the priestess also exemplifies the lives of those women who have been oppressed alongside the goddess culture which has been eradicated under the European dominance. As many as 40 percent African American people claim ancestry to a particular religion and that is the Dahomeyan Voodoo. Lord refers to this ancient West African religion in several of her poems. In Witches in Dahomey, in A Woman Speaks, in Maulisa and in Meat, she has referred to the Voodoo. Under the Dahomeyan Voodoo beliefs, it is regarded that Muvalisa is comprised of Mavu and Lisa who have been recorded as the male and female principle and are also occasionally reported as androgynous same-sex deities. Lord's image of this particular religion elicit memories of slavery, colonization, the aftermath of dehumanizing oppression as well as the richness of the African culture which has been lost to its people in the current generations. Still when we look at Lord's poetry, we find that her lamentation over the persecution of ancient African and goddess cultures also instills a haunting image of rebirth and renewal wherein Lord grants agency to the goddess reviving her spirit through women. In her poetry we find that goddess has become an ageless emblem of divine feminine strength immortalized through the resilience of African women that Lord asserts deserve veneration. The image of the goddess evolves from a figure of worship to a symbol of rebellion also by which women's freedom of expression empowers them. Lord also infers that reclaiming ownership over the victimization of women and the goddess lessens the power of the perpetrators of oppression. So, we can say that this poetry collection, The Black Unicorn, reclaims ownership over the degradation of African religion and women through her assertion that both will rise from the ruins with magic that is, is still unwritten. Another theme which Lotte has touched upon in this poetry collection is eroticism. Her poems pay her spirituality with eroticism which enables her to further her proclamation that freedom of self is revolutionary. She has identified the erotic only as a feminine power and never as a masculine power too. And her combination of the erotic with feminine power invalidates the dominance which men have traditionally claimed over the female sexuality. According to her, to experience the erotic is to do that which is female and self-affirming in the face of a racist, patriarchal and anti-erotic society. Erotic according to Lord empowers but difference also becomes paralysis when silence, separation and lack of dialogue reign among women. Female empowerment necessitates liberation from male defined conceptions of sexuality, spirituality and femininity. So, Lord has introduced eroticism without the accompaniment of the male gaze and she becomes fully autonomous through her sexual empowerment. It is also revealed in many of her poems in this particular collection. For example, we can refer to meat which advances women's sexual sovereignty through her vibrant descriptions of lesbian eroticism. Sexuality according to her reveals creativity that is female as well as self-affirming. 
Black unicorn in this way suggests that women should claim ownership of their sexuality in feminist retaliation. Another theme which has been thoroughly investigated into in the black unicorn by Lord is sexism within the black power movement and racism within the feminist movement. And this approach makes her poetry truly intersectional. For example, her poem, A Litany for Survival, introduces those people who are living in shadows, between doors, unable to enter the world of acceptance. It also outlines the enduring effects of racism before it poignantly ends with the lines. So it is better to speak, remembering we were never meant to survive. The very fact that the Afro-American race has survived is a testimony to their resilience and bravery. Thus, we find that Lord has been able to expose the deep-rooted psychological trauma of being imprinted with fear at a very young and vulnerable age. The conditioning of having lived in fear throughout one's life becomes so ingrained that it becomes the part of the black identity. And she emphasizes the direct causal relationship between racism and internalized racism, where due to the deleterious effects of slavery, the slavery also becomes a mental fact and people start to think that it is natural for them to be subservient to the masters. Through an intersectional investigation of these diverse experiences, Lord aims at having a more holistic understanding of each woman's life. Individual experiences of womanhood, according to Lord, are dependent upon sexual orientation, gender, class, age, race, religion, etc. And she assesses that the separation amongst women lies not in their differences, but rather in their refusal to recognize these differences and to examine the distortions which result from our misnaming them, their effects upon behavior as well as expectation. So the black unicorn portrays the varied lives of women and their varied identities and it acknowledges the necessity of examining each aspect of womanhood through a feminist lens. So her investigation of empowerment through the reclamation of spirituality, autonomy and sexuality as well as race provides insights into the variegated experiences of a black woman. If we evaluate her critique on hegemony, it becomes apparent that intersectional approach is vital to promote an authentic, unified and holistic feminist agenda. I would refer to another publication of Lord, that is Zami, a new spelling of my name. It is popularly understood as a novel or an autobiography. However, Audrey has termed it as a biomythography. Zami is a very unconventional work, though initially I have also identified it as a novel because that is how it is conveniently and popularly known, but still it is an unconventional work. It pioneers a new genre of writing. Audrey herself has called it a combination of elements of biography, history and myth, even though it is really fiction. In other words, we can say that it is fiction which has been built from many resources and according to Lord, it is her way of expanding the vision. Zami is a word from Karikau language. It signifies women who work together as friends as well as perhaps as lovers. She also tells us that Karikau is also the Caribbean island from which her mother had immigrated. Sometimes it is understood and responded to as a building's raman, as it is a narrative of recognition and naming, is a testimony to how Lord has been able to sever from an old identity and community associated with it and has been able to adopt a new identity and revive connections with her new communities. Still we find that whereas Buildings Raman focuses only on an individual's achievement, in Lord we find that community 
is throughout very important, more important than the individual. So, uh, we term it as a novel or as a building's raman, but we have to be aware of this aspect that it is a very unconventional book. It can be termed as a fiction, but in fact the proper word for it is biomythography. It is a building's raman, but at the same time we have to understand that it focuses not only on the individual, but also on the community. Another theme which becomes very important in our understanding of this book is that home for Lord is the land of origin. It is a mythologized land she perhaps can never reach. And in all these dialogues we find that race is equally crucial to her considerations of feminist spaces of contestation as well as contradictions. Zami presents before us to begin with a record of the growing up years of Lord as she was growing up in Harlem in 1930s and 1940s as a child of West Indian parents in a society which had started to have certain diversities, but still it upheld perceived norms and dreaded any deviation from it. The Lord unfortunately had to experience societal mechanisms of exclusion from a very early age as she was growing up in her own words as a fat, black, nearly blind and ambidextrous child in a West Indian household. She also declares that she has drawn much of her strength from the women in her life who have taught her directly or through their own examples how to harness her power. Majority of this book is devoted to stories of other women whom she has celebrated. Thus we can say that she has been able to subvert masculinist authoritative discourses and has turned to matrilineal subjectivities to mother, friends, lovers, sisters and other working class women for guidance and support. The structure of Zami is dominated by intersectional arguments. Lord herself has written that she had always felt that she could never be categorized and she terms this inability to be categorized neatly as both her weakness and strength. The narrative of this book also contains several tropes. It tells us of her tumultuous relationship with her mother and as we have seen earlier, it also pays tributes to other women whose portrayal signals the eraser of black women by a society that had privileged whiteness. In addition to her racial exploitations and difficulties, the book also refers to several other historical contexts which underscore the fear of being the other in terms of racial as well as sexual preferences. The book gives us the background of the Great Depression, the World Wars, and the resultant anxiety amongst the young people as well as the red scare impacting the political climate of the days. Further, Lord has also given detailed descriptions of her lovers which affirms her conceptualization of feminist alliances which is also permitted with certain ambivalence and contestation. Another major theme in this book is the transformative role of myth in creating spaces of contestation as well as transformation. Zami ends as Lord merges with Africate, the Afrocentric figure of the black mother or goddess or the unifying force which transcends restrictions and reclaims the poet as a source of inspiration and knowing beyond western masculinist discourse. The beginning of Zami is written as a prologue. It contains a dedication to Africate and anticipates the women-centered ending. To quote, to the journey woman pieces of myself becoming Africate, unquote. Similarly, the epilogue also pays tribute to the women in Lord's life, forming her empowering and compelling matrilineal genealogy. In Lord's work, we find that feminist alliances are premised upon dismantling and decentering whiteness and its repressive reproduction in feminist politics, which in her opinion would enable 
a genuinely intersectional and transformational feminist activism which should be built on multiplicities. She emphasizes differences and contestations as integral parts of feminist alliances as well as the concept of sisterhood. She thinks that it is necessary to have differences and contestations for strategizing against oppression as it provides us a certain richness of background experiences. Ultimately, we find that Zami is informed by a vision of togetherness. Diverse women sharing their experiences, learning from each other and growing together continually being enriched by their differences, women who live and work together as friends and lovers. Another book which is significant in this context is her 1984 publication, Sister Outsider, Essays and Speeches. The title itself is very intriguing. It is a collection of 15 individual essays and speeches dating from 1976 to 1984. This collection also focuses on her identity of a black woman, a poet, a lesbian by choice, a mother, activist as well as cancer survivor and feminist. Western societies according to Lord have created false binaries, human differences in simplistic opposition to each other. She is able to identify a similar problem within feminism as well as other political movements. She points out that participants are often expected to present only a small portion of their complete identities. They have to either disguise other aspects of their identity or downplay several of them, including sometimes perhaps their race, sexuality or familial relationships, etc. The introduction to the book was written by Nancy Bariano, her editor who founded the feminist press Firebrand Books. The paradoxical title also expresses her commitment to her identity which is based on multiplicities. Through these essays and speech collections, we find that Lord sensitizes us to what has been termed as institutional dehumanization. It is a pattern according to her in the given society which devalues the individuality of the members within an institution in favor of certain ideals. White heterosexual and patriarchal society, for example, discourage the expressions of traits that do not fall into its norm. For example, it values profit over human interest and it adds to the problems which have been created by racism, sexism and similar other prejudices. The groups which have been marginalized by these and similar other prejudices are further marginalized because they also have little economic power. Even minorities, unfortunately, according to Lord, are able to internalize the skewed system of values that teaches that any aberration from the dominant norms is dangerous and it often leads to infighting among minority groups. Lord suggests that one should be able to view the world around us in a way which is somehow less fractured and that political progress can be made only when the differences within individuals are viewed as natural strengths rather than irreconcilable divisions. Differences according to Lord are empowering, never a constraint. Some of these deeply felt concepts are compressed in the poem Sister Outsider, after which this volume has been named. This poem had also appeared in her previous poetry collection, The Black Unicorn, which uses as one of its central motives the ancient wisdom of West African people. Throughout the collection of essays, Lord probes into this ancient wisdom. Other themes she takes in this volume are sisterhood, power of erotic and her concept of difference in connection. Lord had insisted on this idea of sisterhood which embraces the other as well as ourselves at the same time. The phrase sister outsider emphasizes the stark alternative between being an isolated individual 
and an active participant in a community. She also considered that her sexual choices and preferences have also made her an outsider within the black feminist community. Her writing about the issue, she also feels that a retreat from the community would leave an individual as vulnerable and oppressed. In her interpretation of the word erotic, Lord has gone back to the Greek word eros, which is a personification of love in all of its aspect. It is born of chaos and personifies power in harmony. Each part of this definition is critical to her discussion of the uses of the erotic, which include trusting of the self, the chaos not fully understood but from which creativity and harmony would ultimately spring, the power that the passion for life has to move us towards positivistic action. So, according to Lord, erotic is the source of that sharing of joy which provides a deep connection between persons who are different. So, it is one way that differences among people can also become a source of creative dialogue rather than a threat. She also suggests that we have come to distrust that power from which rises our deepest non-rational knowledge and we find that this theme is continued in various other writings of Lord. Another intersectional trope which Lord has taken up in this collection is the theme of difference in connection. She feels that difference is a given fact in any human situation and these differences ultimately are a product of our inability to recognize the notion of difference as a dynamic human force which enriches us rather than threatens us. So, these differences of racism, sexism, ageism, homophobia etc. are ultimately linked to the possibility of a dynamism. In essays like the master's tool will never dismantle the master's house or in learning from the 60s, she comments that movements which spring from society's intolerance of difference like the black movement or the women's movement also tend to be just as intolerant of differences among their constitutes. And this intolerance results in a weakening of the movement and also in the loss of creative possibilities. Her motto is that in our world, divide and conquer must become define and empower. If women are defined as white, heterosexual, young women whose class position enables them to see only certain aspects of life who demand change, then what is lost is the knowledge which is produced by women with certain difference. For example, women of color, older women, poor women or women with different sexual preferences. She further acknowledges the tragedy of anger that black women sometimes direct towards each other or their history of bonding. She suggests that if we succumb to the master's most effective tool that is the pitting of people against one another by using the threat of difference, we would never be able to dismantle the master's house. By it, she means the dominant ideology which create difference. Laudy also reminds the white women that anger between peers births courage, not destruction, and the discomfort and sense of loss it often causes is not fatal but a sign of growth. She also reminds black women who attack lesbianism as anti black, as the sisterhood of work and play and power that is a part of the African tradition. And she suggests that we have been taught to see each other as heartless competitors for the scare male, the all important prize that could legitimize our existence and we have to unlearn it. This dehumanization of the denial of self is no less lethal than the dehumanization of racism to which it is so closely allied. Another publication I would refer to is her 1988 essay compilation, A Burst of Light. This is her last collection of essays for which she was awarded the American Book Award in 1989. This collection begins with an interview 
which had been conducted by Susan Starr and in which she has discussed sadomasochism as an institutionalized celebration of dominate subordinate relationship within the lesbian feminist community. According to her, the impact of these practices reverberate beyond the personal life. She suggests that sadomasochistic relationships generate a power struggle and this power struggle permeates all areas of the life of participants. Because it is not possible for us to remove the sexual aspects of life from other aspects within ourselves. Further, she talks about her experiences of living with cancer and what she had learnt during this struggle. She had refused to be operated on and considered that her struggle with cancer is another phase of that continuing battle for self-determination and survival that black women fight daily, often in triumph. In her essay, I am your sister, black women organizing across sexualities, Lord has taken the reader on an eight-page journey of who she is and reminds her reader that she is a black lesbian. Lord reaches out to straight black women and declares that they should not be threatened or feel repulsed by black lesbians. Rather, they should unite together as black women regardless of their sexual preferences and choices. In turning the beat around Lesbian Parenting 1986, Lord shares her concerns of raising children as lesbian parents. She feels that in a society which is governed by stereotypes and bigotry, their children face harsher challenges. In the essay entitled Apartheid USA, Lord has related apartheid in South Africa to her vision of African-American expandability and suppression in America. She has suggested that black people in America are worse off. However, some critics have termed her views as peculiar and counterproductive. For example, Sarah King and Lester Olson feel that in her attempt to empower the isolated sections of audience, Lord has ultimately belittled those people who are different from her, labeling their broad categories as white, thin, male, heterosexual, Christian and financially secure. A Burst of Light, Living with Cancer is this book's most extended and most personal section consisting of select passages from her journal from the three years following her diagnosis of liver cancer. So when we look at the works of Audrey Lord, we find that she has been able to focus on some most aspects of intersectional attitude in her work. For example, she had suggested that there is a necessity of rooting out practices of domination people have somehow internalized in their struggle to exist. This is also a major contribution to the third wave feminist discourse which had alerted us to the differences which exist within the larger umbrella term of womanhood. With Audrey Lord, we have concluded our discussion of intersectionality. In the next modules, we would begin our discussion of gender blurring, another important concept to understand in the context of gender as we understand it today. Thank you.